This is the lecture for Monday, the 6th of June, 2022. I want your textbooks back tomorrow. This counts as an easy homework assignment. Uh, if you get it in tomorrow in good condition, cover it off. Your notes and paper, paper uh, uh, bookmarks out of it. You get an A+. Plus. If it comes in later than that, you don't get an A+. Plus. If it doesn't come in, you get a zero, and a bunch of other things happen. Because they did cost over $150 a piece. So tomorrow, number two. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the Great Crusade, towards which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. In company with our brave allies and brothers in arms on other fronts, you will bring about the destruction of the German war machine, the elimination of Nazi tyranny over oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. He will fight savagely. But this is the year, 1944. Much has happened since the Nazi triumphs of 1940-41. The United Nations have inflicted upon the Germans great defeats in open battle, man-to-man. -man. Our air offensive has seriously reduced the strength, their strength in the air, and their capacity to wage war on the ground. Our home fronts have given us overwhelming superiority in weapons and munitions of war and placed at our disposal great reserves of trained fighting men. The tide has turned. The free men of the world are marching today together to victory. I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. We will accept nothing less than full victory. Good luck, and let us all beseech the blessings of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. Thus wrote General Dwight David Eisenhower, Supreme Commander, Allied Forces in Europe, the leader of the English-speaking peoples as they were beginning to invade the mainland of Europe to create a Western Front for the first time since the fall of France. The Russians, of course, had broken the back of Germany's army at Stalingrad and later at Kursk. But Russia alone was not going to win the war. The Allies had to land. Now, there were five landing beaches, as, I, as, as you may recall, and on four of them the invasion went reasonably quickly and successfully. But on Omaha Beach, where Americans faced a 200-foot cliff right behind the beach, there were massive casualties and there was a possibility of failure. Now, Eisenhower had written another message of, gee, we tried, it's my fault, we were defeated. Luckily, that didn't have to happen. Now, the people who heard this message were just a little older than you. Actually, just a little older than some of you. The same exact age as some of you. And they were no different from you, except they had heeded their nation's call, put on a uniform, and were heading into a kill zone. And they did it. Some of them didn't get a day older. Many of them. But they did it. And in doing so, created conditions for victory and the possibility of the post-World War II world being something other than the totalitarian slaughter fest that it had been before the war. That was June 6, 1944, Operation Overlord, the invasion of Normandy, France, or commonly known as D-Day. Do you have any questions, comments, or thoughts in commemoration of this before we move into today's lesson, which is the Cold War in 40 minutes? I see no questions. Okay. You're whispering. Not insane. I only got part of the uh, part of my notes on the board, so let's get started. Remember, the Cold War begins in the summer of 1944, almost a year before the end of World War II. 
when the Poles of Warsaw rose up against the Nazis and the Soviet forces at the end of Operation Bagration stopped on the eastern shore of the Vistula and watched for over a week as the Germans vented their fury on the Polish National Army because the Soviets did not want Poles whose loyalties were with the government in exile in London to be around. They wanted their stooges, the Lublin Poles, a group of Polish communists sponsored by Stalin, to take over. The Warsaw Uprising has nothing to do with World War II or beating the Nazis, has everything to do with establishing a Soviet empire in Eastern Europe. So, the other reason for it, aside from the fact that Stalin, well, you knew how he ruled, a man who does those kind of purges consistently is not going to be the kind of fellow that wants any outside force that's strong anywhere near Russia. So the farther west the Soviet armies go, the farther west the Soviet security zone begins. And given that the Russians lost about 30 million people in World War II, the Soviets, should I say, it is reasonable to assume that in this case, if not in many others, Stalin had the absolute support of the people. They did not want to be invaded again. It had happened twice in the last 30 years from the Germans. We don't want it again. So where the Red Army goes, communism is going to be established. There are pretenses of democracy, and there's one exception, Austria. The Soviets and the Americans both withdraw from Austria and establish it as a neutral country. Finland is also, <clears throat> interestingly, not absorbed by the Soviet Empire, perhaps because they remember uh, how difficult it was in the Winter War, perhaps because before the Soviets got to the Finnish borders, the Finns withdrew to the lines that they had after losing the Winter War, and they basically rolled over like a dog and exposed their vitals. They got rid of Mannerheim, and they established a government basically friendly to the Soviets. And the term Finlandization is what happens when a country wishes to be neutralized in the Cold War. Austria and Finland were both neutralized. Switzerland remained neutral. But everyone else was forced to choose a side. Well, Sweden remained neutral also. Sweden's weird. Um, the Soviets take over in Poland. They absorb the Baltic states. The Baltic states no longer have an independent existence, not for the entire Cold War. Uh, they take over Poland. They take over the eastern half of Germany, except for the island of freedom that is going to be West Berlin. They take over Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania. Yugoslavia is freed by its own communist forces under Marshal Tito. Marshal Tito thumbs his nose at Stalin and achieves a variant of neutrality because it wasn't the Red Army that freed the Yugoslavs, it was the Yugoslavs themselves. Tito was, though, a hardcore Marxist when it came to running his country. So the Soviets were willing to accept a Yugoslavia that was domestically as Stalinistic as Stalin could possibly want it to be, but a foreign policy that occasionally thumbed its nose at the Russians because uh, Tito felt the need to demonstrate his independence. Eastern Europe was under Soviet dominion because that's where the Soviet armies were. Churchill, who was voted out of office between the fall of Germany and the fall of Japan in the middle of the Potsdam Conference, um, Churchill is invited by President Truman to uh, a university in Missouri, Truman's home state, at Fulton. And at Fulton, Missouri, in 1947, Churchill makes the famous speech, which culminates in an iron curtain has descended across the continent of Europe, and beyond that curtain, the great ancient capitals of Central and Eastern Europe languish. Churchill is warning the Americans and the West about the Soviets and their threat. In 1946-47, many Americans still see the Soviets as, quote, our Russian allies, unquote, our gallant Russian allies. And they see Uncle Joe Stalin as sort of a, an eccentric but friendly dictator. Things will happen that will change this view. 
And this view is obvious. Americans, though not sacrificing nearly as much as the Poles or the Russians, the Chinese or the French or even the British, Americans fought the good fight. We wanted it to be over. We wanted to go home, buy homes in the newly building suburbs, raise families. They didn't want an ongoing trouble, but they have no choice. The last time we said the problems of others are not our own, Hitler rose in Germany, Mussolini in Italy, Stalin thrived in the Soviet Union, and the world came to another war. So most of the World War II veterans appreciated America needs to be engaged with the world. If we're not engaged with the world, the world will bite us. So Churchill's speech begins to cause some Americans to wonder, are we really okay with what the Russians are doing in Eastern Europe? An American diplomat, a young man named George Kennan, who's assigned to the Moscow Embassy, writes what history knows as the Long Telegram, warning the American State Department, which is also filled with dreamers, believe it or not. Foggy Bottom has dreamers, but it does. Warning the State Department that the Soviets are engaged in everything short of war in a conflict and a competition with the United States, and that we better do some things. And Kennan's recommendation in this long telegram is what is called containment. Containment is a strategy short of war. Containment means I won't try to take back your communist lands. Your communist land. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> it's the future of mankind. I'm sorry. Uh, your communist nations are going to remain your communist nations. I may try to undermine, you know, but that's that's that's. Everyone tries it. You're going to try to undermine me. But if you expand into this territory, I will fight you. I will join up with conservative forces in Lithuania, and I will push you back to your Red Empire. Uh, that's containment. Containment involves ideas uh, that are rooted not in Clausewitz and his notions of aggressive war in the Western tradition, but of Sun Tzu and his notions of war as a, an aspect of Confucian balance in the Eastern tradition. It involves action and counteraction that is proportionate. It involves a calculation to prevent the Soviets from expanding too much or too quickly without provoking a general war, which nobody wants. But what really sells the notion that the Soviets are a threat is what happens in Berlin. In the three zones of Western Germany, the British zone, the American zone, and the zone that British and Americans give the French to make them feel like partners, <laughs> um, the uh, Allied authorities in the West are trying to encourage the development of a new self-governing post-Nazi Germany, which is ultimately going to become the uh, Federal Republic of Germany which in the Cold War is known as West Germany, and after the Cold War became all of Germany. The Soviets do not want this. They try a series of gambits, but all of their gambits involve them controlling the government in Berlin, which is in the eastern zone of Germany, controlled by the Soviets. So in order to compel the Western powers to give up their plans of a unified West Germany, the Soviets blockade Berlin. There will be no travel by canal, by rail, by road. The only ways in and out of West Berlin, who has a British, American, and a French zone, because German, Germany's capital was divided as Germany was after the World War. But Berlin is deep inside Eastern Europe. The only way in or out is by three narrow air corridors. Now, the Soviets remembered when the fat transvestite drug addict Hermann Goering promised Hitler that he would supply Stalingrad from the air. They're not very worried about an airlift, keeping a city of millions alive in what looks to be a cold, cold winter. But Operation Vittles is established, very American name, Operation Vittles. An American uh, air, uh, Army Air Force, later Air Force General, uh, is put in charge of setting up a supply system that has American transport planes taking off and landing, in some cases, every 15 seconds. 
We fly in rain. We fly in fog. We use radar to take off and land. Our planes, imagine that these are buildings in Berlin, and that's the beginning of the landing strip. Our planes have to go down, down, down within dozens of feet of, of, of existent buildings in East Germany, which the Russians aren't going to take down to make our lives easier, to land on a narrow landing strip. We ship coal to a city that relies upon coal for fuel in the coldest winter on record, successfully, along with food and medical supplies. The Berlin airlift lasts over a year, and it involves an American commitment to the people of West Berlin. We will not give you up. We will not let you fall under the red tyranny. Americans die. So do Brits. So do Frenchmen. Planes crash. Planes collide. Occasionally, American planes stray from the uh, prescribed corridors, and Soviet fighters drive them back in. It's not easy to supply a city of millions with coal from the air. I can think of few things that are less efficient, but we do it. And in the course of the Berlin airlift, the West finds its backbone and finds its vision. We will not allow the Soviets to absorb infinitely. We will stand up. Another thing, for whatever reason I didn't mention in your notes, but it's one of the most important things, is what is called the Marshall Plan. Now, you will hear people of all kinds in college and elsewhere talk about American imperialism, how Uncle Sam wants to take over the world and make it into Disneyland. Rammstein, the German heavy metal band, has a song called We All Live in America, which if you want a notion of the uh, idea that America is an imperialistic nation trying to export our culture around the world, listen to it. Um, it's funny from a certain point of view. The thing is, though, in 1947-48, we proved that that was not the case. Proved it with something called the Marshall Plan. General George Marshall was the leading army general in Washington, D.C. in World War II. He organized for victory. And General Marshall became Secretary of State under Truman. That's the leading foreign policy official in America. And he determined that communist parties in Italy and France were gaining traction, and it was very likely that the Soviets might not even have to invade Western Europe, that uh, communist victories in Italy and France might be combined with other destabilizations, and that Western Europe would collapse under Soviet political pressure. Why? Because Europe is a freaking stone, uh, stone wasteland. It is, uh, it's, a, it's a rubble heap filled with the dead and the evidences of war. Even Britain. Britain financially loses more by winning World War II than Germany does by losing World War II. Germany recovers financially in the early 60s. Britain doesn't really fully recover until after the year 2000. So General Marshall leads an effort to rebuild Western Europe. The American economy is at the heart of the world. We are the only industrial plant not bombed back to the Stone Age. We supply the world with a greater proportion of industrial goods than ever before or since. This great wealth and great power could have allowed us to absorb the free world into a great American empire. Instead, with the Marshall Plan money, we rebuild Germany, we re rebuild France, we help rebuild England. We do this not to create strings. It's not another Athenian empire before the Peloponnesian War. We rebuild Germany, including the Volkswagen factories that helped put Detroit out of business in the 1970s. We build the French economy, just so French President de Gaulle in the 1960s can say nasty things, which I cannot repeat in this class to you English-speaking peoples, and leave NATO. We rebuild a bunch of independent countries that really enjoy proving they're not American client states by sticking it to us when and how they like. But we do it because we believe in freedom.
If America were trying to build a global empire, the Marshall Plan would have turned Western Europe into American colonies the way the Red Army turned Eastern Europe into Soviet colonies. That doesn't happen. As Americans, if there's anything for you to be proud of in our heritage, learn about the Marshall Plan. One of my failures this year in having to compress all the rest of history into this one week is that I can't go into sufficient detail. But the Marshall Plan staunches the economic bleeding and weakens and undermines the communist appeal in Western Europe. People who have enough food rarely are willing to give the government the kind of power that communists demand. People who are starving might. So, as a result of the Berlin Airlift and the Marshall Plan, an American commitment to Europe and to containment is clarified. In 1947, the national security law is passed, which establishes the Pentagon to rule the American military, the Central Intelligence Agency to coordinate America's spy and covert operations around the world to fight the Soviets in wars of assassins, and a bunch of other structural changes to prepare the United States for a long twilight struggle, which is a euphemism for the Cold War. We also establish with our Western European partners the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO. NATO, an aegis that says an attack on one is an attack on all, has kept the peace in Europe, west of Russia, since 1945. It is the longest peace since the Pax Romana, since the 200, 100s AD, since the time of Marcus Aurelius. And the reason that Putin was emboldened to attack the Ukraine is because the Ukraine was never made part of NATO. Because the West wasn't sure it wanted to press the Russians so closely. The notion is that NATO it makes you invulnerable to Russian attack. I promise you, this is like notions that the Titanic is unsinkable. It is something that will be tested at some point. The last time the NATO treaty was activated was September the 11th, 2001, when Germans and Brits and others joined us in an attack to overthrow the Taliban government of Afghanistan, which was where bin Laden planned his murderous attacks from. And uh, NATO allies fought with America in Afghanistan for close to 20 years. So in Europe, a structure for containing the Soviets is built in the early Cold War, the late 1940s. In the late 1940s in Asia, the simple version is this. The nationalist government, which had led the fight against the Japanese, the party of the Guomintang, head, headed by Chiang Kai-shek, is driven off the mainland of China by the Communist Party under Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong takes over China, and in 19, on, I think it was October 1st, early October 1949, the People's Republic of China is proclaimed. In Taiwan, Chiang Kai-shek claims to be the legitimate leader of China, and from the late 1940s through the 1970s and 80s, the Kuomintang had a one-party monopoly of control over the nation of Taiwan. And they continued to claim to be the only government of China. Until the 1970s, we in the United Nations agreed. But in the early 1970s, President Nixon tilted away from Taiwan to China. And now the People's Republic of China, the Chinese Communist Party, has all of the official recognition of the United States. Taiwan, on the other hand, has become a multi-party democracy. And the Kuomintang hasn't been in power for the last five or six years in Taiwan. The only reason they haven't claimed independence yet is because the communists have promised that will trigger an invasion. But the communists seem to be planning an invasion, and they've worked very hard at sending warships and warplanes into Taiwanese air and sea space, uh, testing Taiwan's defenses increasingly for the last few years. So China, going communist, defines the, late, the early phase of the Cold War in Asia. A uh, communist ally of China and the Soviets, Kim Il-sung's 
Democratic People's Republic of North Korea, of Korea or North Korea controls the part of the Korean Peninsula occupied by Soviet troops. And in the summer of 1950, Kim Il-sung gets permission from Stalin to invade South Korea. One possible reason for this is that the American Secretary of State, a man named Dean Natcherson, made a speech in Asia, or about Asia, and our security zone, where he mentions Japan, the Philippines, ba 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 and accidentally leaves out South Korea. It's like a list of areas that are important to the United States and Asia, and he leaves out South Korea. So whether this is what persuades Stalin or whether Stalin is simply aggressive and he wants to press the free world with fighting but not in Europe, the North invades the South, and the expectation is the North will win. They have a Soviet-trained army. They have Russian T-34 tanks. Um, but the Russians make an error. In the United Nations organization, there is a group called the Security Council. In the Security Council, the United Nations can determine to use force to stop aggression. The Soviets are a member, a permanent member of the Security Council, so are we. But because we won't recognize communist China in the United Nations, and we've blocked the United Nations from recognizing communist China, the Soviets boycott the Security Council. So Soviet representatives are not present when a proposal is made for the United Nations organization to intervene in Korea to stop aggression. For one of the only times in its existence, the United Nations organization does something which personally pleases Mr. Genorio. <laughs> I'm hard to please. He, uh, they, vote to intervene. So it's the United Nations, not the United States, which intervenes in the Korean War to push the communists back north of the 38th parallel of north latitude, which is where the border had been between the two Koreas. But of course, Americans are put in charge. General MacArthur from World War II is put in charge of the Allied efforts. And instead of fighting down at the southern tip of Korea, near what is called uh, the Pusong Perimeter, the communists drive all Allied forces down to this corner of Korea, nearest to Japan. MacArthur starves this area of reinforcements. Instead, builds up a massive amphibious force and lands at Incheon, halfway up the Korean Peninsula. Looking up here would be a good idea since I'm actually pointing at maps. So the Koreans, South Koreans and North Koreans are fighting down here. MacArthur does an end run around them, lands in the center of Korea. It, it's a gamble, but it works. The, Norks, the North Koreans are driven back north, and MacArthur drives towards the border of communist China. Remember, China hadn't won a war with Western powers or Westernized powers since before the Opium War in the early 1800s. So when the Chinese Communist Party began braying and complaining about the United Nations getting too close to their borders, MacArthur didn't take it seriously. However, the People's Republic of China had first-class fieldcraft at that point. They infiltrated over a million men through our lines, and we didn't know it. Until just around Thanksgiving, 1950, Red China intervened in the war. The longest, bloodiest retreat in American military history happens from the Chosin Reservoir up near China's border down to the coast, where U.S. Marines fight a retreat and then board ships and escape. Korea is going to be a test of wills between the West and the East, a proxy war. For the next few years, both sides try different things. The Soviets send their best MiG fighters into battle. General MacArthur talks about bringing the Chinese nationalists in, and he gets fired for it. He also talks about using nuclear weapons. He gets fired for it. Um, here's what's interesting about the Korean War. After that first year where the North almost wins and then the South almost wins with UN help, the fighting takes place around the 38th parallel of North Latitude, just where the border used to be. 
And talks begin, peace talks begin between the North and the South, between the United Nations and the Chinese, the Russians, and the North Koreans. And for over six months, those peace talks were stalled because the North didn't like the shape of the table. Different table shapes were produced. They didn't like the shape of the table. What's that about? What was the Japanese strategy in World War II after they lost Midway and Guadalcanal? What did they gamble? This is just a few weeks ago. Yes. Wasn't it like to dull their men just to break the spirit of the Americans? In effect. If you kill enough Americans, we'll go away. We're soft. We love our lives. We're not going to fight for some Asian country we don't know. So the last two years of the Korean War are about inflicting casualties on the Americans and on the United Nations forces to see if we're willing to pay the blood price for South Korea's continued existence. That's what negotiations over the shape of the table where the peace treaty is going to be negotiated is all about. It's about placing psychological and emotional pressure on the liberty-loving, life-loving, soft, luxury-loving Americans. And year after bloody year, we and the British and the Greeks and the Turks and our other allies pay a price in blood to hold the 38th parallel. We don't advance, they don't advance, we hold the line. After Stalin's death and the uh, election of General Eisenhower to become President of the United States, peace is established. No, 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 not peace. A ceasefire. A temporary ceasefire. There's never been a peace treaty. Officially, the United States, I'm sorry. Officially, the United Nations is still at war with North Korea. But a ceasefire was established, which is still in effect. Now, since the ceasefire in the 1960s there and 70s, there were occasions where patrols uh, in the demilitarized zone, sort of a neutral zone between North and South, were ambushed by North Koreans with machetes. They attacked our guys with melee weapons, not guns, to see if we would stop sending patrols into the DMZ, which we had a right to do, and they had a right to do. Um, in 1969, an American intelligence ship, um, the... USS Pueblo was seized by North Korean forces and held for about a year. The crew was. Liberty was never returned. Or the uh, Pueblo has ne was never returned. There have been incidents along the borders with uh, between the Koreas ever since the ceasefire. But since the ceasefire, there has not been the outbreak of another ongoing full-scale general war. So Korea and Stalin's death... <clears throat> tends to move the Cold War into a more stable set, uh, set of uh, battles. A Cold War is a struggle. People are going to fight and die on a small scale. We will fight with propaganda, which you know is using advertising techniques to sell ideas. We will fight with uh, st uh, the status symbols, like the Soviets launching the Sputnik satellite into orbit, a basketball-sized Artificial moon, the first artificial satellite ever. The Soviets launching uh, Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space. Uh, the Soviets doing the first space walk with Alexei Leonov and Titov. And the Americans being the first on the moon, July 21st, 1969. And the Americans being the only people to ever go to the moon on several voyages from 1969 through December 1972. Ooh. Being Americans... We decide that the moon is the only thing that matters and claim victory in the space race. <laughs> the Soviets have, and the Russians continue to have, a much better manned program uh, than we do. They're willing to spend money on it. That's why for the last 15 years we've had to hitch rides on Russian rockets to send men into space, men and women, and uh, even to go to the space station that we helped fund and build. <sighs> We haven't had a manned spacecraft since the space shuttle was um, declared obsolete, again, about 10 or 15 years ago. But that's pop propaganda. We will also fight in terms of wars of assassins and spies. The nation of Iran in the early 1950s elects a national socialist, not a Nazi, but a socialist who's nationalist, named Mossadegh. Mossadegh nationalizes Aramco, or uh, not Aramco, the, uh, the oil industry in Iran which the British depend upon and which, at that time, we depend upon. 
So the Iranians have elected a guy who is making trouble in the world of oil. The CIA arranges for his overthrow. We gather renta mobs in Tehran, and our, our, our economic and political instability causes Mossadegh to fall, and we replace him with the Shah of Iran, the Emperor of Persia who is going to rule Iran from the early 1950s until 1978 when he's overthrown. We'll talk about that tomorrow. In Hungary, in 1956, the Hungarian people rise up. They rise up against the Soviets and their own communist overlords because Stalin is dead. And the secret is that Stalin's successor, Nikita Khrushchev, has criticized Stalin publicly at a Communist Party conference. If the new Soviet leader is more liberal, maybe he will allow Eastern Europe to have self-rule. Or better, independence. So the people of Hungary rise up and drive out the communists for a few weeks. And then the Red Army and the Allied armies of the Soviet Union invade, invade Hungary and crush the uprising, most bloodily. Khrushchev may have notions of liberalizing the Stalinist system inside of Russia, but he's not letting Eastern Europe go. Berlin is a running sore. Communists claim to be the future. They claim to have the answers to wealth inequality and the unequal distribution of resources. And yet, every week, Hundreds of Germans escape East Germany by sneaking into West Berlin and not returning and then taking an aircraft from West Berlin to Western Germany. This is an embarrassment. Berlin is an island of freedom in a Soviet sea. So in August 1961, the East German authorities build fencing which will become a wall around Western Berlin. There is a famous picture of a, an East German border guard on that day, who for a moment is not under observation. And he runs, runs for his life in the Soviet zone across to the Allied zone, the American zone, and he's not killed. He spends the remainder of the Cold War in the West as something of a hero. After the Cold War ends and the Berlin Wall falls, he goes back to his old home in East Germany, and they treat him like dirt because they think he's a, they call him a coward. We had to endure while well, you got to escape. That poor man killed himself because the people in his own hometown resented that he had gotten away and they didn't. they didn't. So the Berlin Wall goes up. Does this provoke war? Well, there are people who think it should. It's a violation of the post-war treaties. But with the Berlin Wall, American and French and British can still travel by land. There is, it's not another blockade but Germans cannot cross into West Berlin without strong control on the part of the East Germans and the Soviets. It's about stopping the hemorrhage of German talent westward. If you go on YouTube, and if we had more time, I'd show you video of people being pulled up into a building that's on the west side of the boundary, and Stasi, German, East German uh, communist border troops, grabbing their feet and trying to yank them back down. People are playing tug of war with human beings to try to get the human beings out of the communist lands. President Kennedy says this is not an issue that should cause a war. In fact, this is not a sign of strength. This is a sign of weakness. If the communist system were working, they wouldn't need to build a wall to keep their people in. The fact that they had to build a wall is evidence that communism is not providing a better life for its people. President Kennedy goes to Berlin 
And in front of the Brandenburg Gate, which is one of the most famous spots on the border between West and East, but the Brandenburg Gate in the background says famously, for those who doubt freedom, the value of freedom, let them come to Berlin. For those who doubt there's a difference between communism and the West, let them come to Berlin. And he culminates with, I and every person in the free world, and I'm paraphrasing, would be lucky if they could make this boast, the highest boast of pride. Ich bin ein Berliner. Which Kennedy believes means I am a Berliner. And the people of Berlin understand exactly what Kennedy means, and they cheer. What basically Kennedy is saying is that the free world in microcosm is in Berlin, and every person in the free world is beset like the people of Berlin, surrounded by hostile enemies, surrounded by a wall, but proudly free. I am a Berliner. In fact, as I understand the German from people who speak German, what Kennedy actually said is, I am a jelly donut. Apparently a Berliner, Berliner, is a jelly donut. It's a form of pastry. But the Berliners know what he meant. <laughs> Donuts are powerful things. <laughs> Do you remember the Danish War of German Unification? <laughs> so, um, Kennedy is going to come uh, front and center in this Cold War. I guess I am going to do this for about two lessons. I just thought it would be one, but... The island of Cuba was run by Fulgicino Batista. That's where my abuelo comes from, from Cuba. And Batista was not only friendly to freedom, he was so friendly to free market that he ended up partnering with the mafia to build a variety of mafia-run casinos. But in Cuba, up to that point, being a rebel was sort of like a national sport. They had baseball. Cubans love baseball. And they had being a rebel. And then the Sierra Maestra, the mountains in the south of Cuba near, um, near Guantanamo um, and near San Juan Hill, where Teddy Roosevelt fell, or fought, a group of Cuban communists, are, or Cuban nationalists, they call themselves, are fighting the Batista regime. And on New Year's Day, 1959, they drive into Havana, the capital of Cuba, drive out Batista, and uh, become the new government. The leader of this rebel group is Fidel Castro, who has a good Cuban beard, which means it's patchy and it takes decades to fill in. Trust me, I know. I have the same kind of beard. So, Batista's out, Castro's in. And at first, Castro doesn't announce that he is a communist. He tries being friendly to the Americans and seeing, sees what he can get. But when the American CIA decides to overthrow Castro, Castro gets naughty and angry. Castro is seen by American intelligence networks as a communist stooge. So... One of the first decisions of President Kennedy's presidency is whether or not to launch an invasion of Cuba with Cuban exiles who were anti-Castro at the Bay of Pigs. This uh, operation was set up by the CIA under President Eisenhower, and Kennedy is, well, he decides to go. It is a giant disaster. We spend a lot of time moving ships off the shore and other places outside of the radar range of the Cubans. We don't know that. We think that we're going to distract them, but they don't have radar that can see our ships. Also, the Cuban exile groups that we're going to use as ground soldiers are infiltrated with communist spies, and they have one job. Land on the beach at the Bay of Pigs, seize a radio station, claim we are the legitimate government of Cuba, we request American aid, and the American uh, military forces are ready to invade. All they have to do is get a hold of that radio station. But instead of arriving on an empty beach, they arrive on a beach with tanks and artillery and rockets waiting for them, and they get slaughtered. It's an embarrassment. It makes Kennedy look weak, and Kennedy says, whoa, I guess that was a mistake. He takes responsibility. The next year, 
uh, 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 well, then Kennedy does not push back, at least as the Russians see it, about Berlin. Kennedy seems weak. Khrushchev meets Kennedy at Geneva in a summit meeting. A summit is when the leaders of America and Russia come together. Khrushchev is a World War II commissar veteran. He was at Stalingrad. Khrushchev helped stiffen the spine of the Soviets at Stalingrad. This is a guy who's as deep in blood as you can possibly get. He was a bit more liberal than Stalin, but that's like saying Mephistopheles is a bit more sophisticated than Asmodeus. Those are two names for Satan. Kennedy is a pretty boy who likes the women. <laughs> he fought in World War II, genuine hero in the sense that he fought the Japanese one night in the Solomon Islands. His PT boat, which is made of plywood, gets sliced in half by a Japanese destroyer, and he gets his men to shore and then swims out into the current for three nights trying to signal help and finally gets help. His back is never the same. So one of the things Kennedy is addicted to, other than dangerous sex, is injections by a guy named Dr. Feelgood. Well, that's his nickname. Dr. Feelgood makes injections of, well, I don't, I don't even know what's in them. But it made people happy and it gave them energy. In Kennedy, Khrushchev saw a weak boy, not a man. So Khrushchev decides to push. And he sends intermediate range nuclear missiles to Cuba. As those missiles are being set up, it's known that this will place New York and Washington within five or ten minutes of a nuclear strike. There's never been any threat like this to the United States ever before. We have missiles in Turkey they can reach Moscow in about that amount of time, but Moscow's in Russia. Moscow's, the Russians, they're used to being part of here. We're not. An American intelligence plane spot these missiles being built, and Kennedy has a choice to make. And we will leave things no. there. <laughs> Haley, no. questions? No, I don't have questions. No. Okay. Yeah, we will continue tomorrow. No. No. You're going to be here. Yeah. Good. But it's still so interesting. Yes, it is. As it is, I just had to do, let's see, 20 years and 40 minutes. I'll try to get the rest. Thank you. Come again.